any given year, like a random year 100 years ago, they invented in that year the first hamburger bun, a serious contribution to civilization, as you'll discover in a moment. The first cloverleaf interchange was patented in that year, and of course, then you immediately needed the first tow truck. <laughs> the first light switch, we're still using that technology 100 years later, so don't discount an innovation that arrives today, because 100 years from now, people will still depend on it. The first condenser microphone, I'm using it right now. And stainless steel, without which this building wouldn't be possible. And more important, the greatest contribution to civilization, the first self-service supermarket. It looked like this. It was called the Piggly Wiggly. Very inspiring name. But the Piggly Wiggly was a serious contribution to the future of business, as you'll discover shortly. That was the patent for the first Cloverleaf exchange. That was a catalog entry for the first tow truck. You could order it off a catalog so anyone could be a tow truck driver. It was the Uber of its day. And that was Walt Anderson who invented the first standardized hamburger bun. But the significance of that photo is what lurks in the background. His own private jet, well, not quite a jet, but a private plane. But on that plane is a logo. It says, you can't see the full logo, but it says White Castle System. And the important part of that logo is the word system, because it was the first franchise system for fast food in the world, made possible by the standardized hamburger bun, which led to a century of uh, franchising opportunity and disaster, of course. The White Castle still survives to this day. That was the very first one. But you'd be hard-pressed to find one, because they have been so heavily submerged under all the other franchises that they helped to make possible. And then, of course, there was Harry Brearley, the inventor of stainless steel and the stainless steel smile to the camera, which we still use to this day. The point is that disruption is not new. The difference is that it's all connected, and more important than being connected is that it's instant. Look what happened to Piggly Wiggly and what it gave the world. Yes, the first turnstile in a retail outlet, but the important thing about this image is what lurks in the background. Those are shelves filled with products which are restocked as people remove them from the shelves. That was the invention of the concept of just-in-time inventory. And that inspired Toyota to come up with the Toyota production system, which was the beginning of various radical innovations in uh, business thinking, including the Kaizen uh, system for, for continual improvement that Toyota uh, brought to the world, and is still today a massive influence on other business models and ways of thinking about business. But it took 30 years from the Piggly Wiggly to the Toyota production uh, system. Because innovation and disruption was not connected, it meant that disruption in itself was not a thing, it was not abundant, although innovation and invention was already abundant at that point. In the meantime, there were numerous innovations, numerous uh, inventions, and most of them vanished without a trace. So some of these you may not know today. That was uh, the electric belt that would heal any of your ills. It was the Fitbit of its day. So 100 years uh, from now, people may well laugh at the ads that you see for smartwatches and uh, fitness devices because it will all be built into your uh, skin. You won't need to buy a device uh, for it. That was the Vieroscope on top and the Glyphoscope at the bottom. And those were the virtual reality headsets of their time. They were called stereoscopes, and you could look at dual images and see them in 3D. It was radical. We still use it. Oh, wait, we don't. Then we get to the 1930s, where robots were suddenly an exciting concept. The movie Metropolis had been foisted on the world, and everyone saw a future in which robots could take over. But they were already thinking about machine learning, and this particular royal typewriter allegedly was adaptable to the user. It learned how the user worked on the typewriter and would adapt its tension to uh, that user, and people actually believed it at the time. Today, they still believe that kind of thing. And then we get to the 1960s, where 
uh, you had your first alleged uh, music recorders uh, for the home. They were almost as good as the voice recorders we have on our cell phones today, where we also record our voices uh, or record our messages or our own singing in the shower, and then we lose it forever in the same way that those records were lost forever, because we don't know where to store them or where to find them. More important, we had these amazing innovations that people really believed would work. For $3, you could have a wrist radio and speak to someone on the other end uh, of the city. Now, really, and if you waited for Black Friday, you could get two for uh, uh, $3. Uh, and if you waited for Cyber Monday, you could get three for uh, $3. But uh, the most significant invention of all from the 1960s, of course, was X-ray uh, specs. For only $1, you didn't even have to wait for Black Friday uh, to get your uh, X-ray specs uh, dirt cheap. You can start seeing a picture emerging. This was the Kickstarter of the 1960s. And people used to invest in it. They used to send their money in, and they still do today, for the same kind of products on Kickstarter. Anyone selling X-ray specs on uh, Kickstarter? Um, I'm in the market for a couple of them, because I'm sure by now they must work as advertised. And then the 1970s, a very tough time to be a geek, because that's what your smartwatch uh, looked like. And they also had a very good sense of what your social life was like, because this is how they sold modems to you. That was a blazing fast 4,800 bits per second uh, modem. You could get probably an entire sentence downloaded in the, uh, the 18 minutes that you would listen to a TED talk uh, today. And I have to say, the geeks got very excited about it, but I'm not sure if it was about the advertising or about the modem um, itself. The lesson of all of that is not every innovation operates as advertised, not every innovation meets a need either. Let's quickly fast forward to the present day before we, re we resume our journey uh, through time. Last month, October 2016, look at these two massive innovations that were going to change financial services in South Africa that were shut down. Vodacom closed down M-Pesa, despite the fact that it's still widely popular in Kenya. It's transformed the Kenya economy. It died without a trace almost in South Africa. And MTN shut down mobile money which has transformed access to money in countries like Uganda and Ghana. Why? Because you have to get into a taxi and pay money to get to an ATM to draw money. So you've got to pay money to get money. So naturally, it's a solution for those countries. In South Africa, there's an ATM on every corner. There's a money transfer service in every retail outlet. You don't need money, uh, mobile money in a country like this. Not every innovation meets a real need in every country in which it's launched. Let's look at what happened just five years ago. 2011, as we resume our journey through time, we find that the biggest and best known tech brands in the world failed, not just once, but again and again. So in 2010, these two products were launched by the two companies with the most cash in the bank of any company in the world, Apple and Microsoft. iTunes Ping, a music social network, of course it's going to work. They own iTunes, they own the world of music. Of course, anything they put out there is going to work. Microsoft, Microsoft knows how to produce smartphones. Oh wait, um, I take that back. But they imagine that a smartphone dumbed down for children would be a thing. Because of course, children don't want the very latest in gadgetry. They don't operate at the cutting edge. So let's sell this thing to children. And then in 2011, Products that were launched um, in that year and closed down in that year started with the BlackBerry Playbook. The first tablet from BlackBerry it was going to save the company. Start problem. There was no email on the first playbook. No email on a tablet. What were they thinking? I have no idea. I still don't know to this day how they could do that. Facebook invented email. You could now do email through Facebook because no one had an email account in 2011. And then daily deals. Well, Groupon took five years to discover that it was a dead uh, business model, but uh, Facebook closed down the same year to their credit. Google, the biggest site in the world, of course, if they launch a um, social network, let's call it Google+, Plus, everyone's going to embrace it. No one needed what Google+, Plus offered. And HP, the biggest computer company in the world at one stage, selling the most uh, notebooks and laptops, obviously, if they went into um, uh, tablets, and produce something called a touchpad with their own operating system, everyone would go for it, 
And of course, who remembers WebOS? I don't. And then in subsequent years, they kept failing. Facebook launched the first Facebook phone through HTC, the HTC first. I don't remember that one either. And anyone here got nostalgia for Google Glass? The legacy of Google Glass is the word glass hole. And that's a lesson to anyone who thinks that innovation for its own sake is going to attract the public, it's going to attract investment, and it's going to attract the consumer. However, every single innovation shows us what's possible. And we have never had the kind of abundance of innovation that we have today. Yes, 2016, abundance. 1960s, abundance. But today, abundance like never before. What we don't have is an abundance of attention. So each new innovation, that's, I know, redundant, but some innovations are really old if you uh, look at the past. But every innovation has to attract the attention and the wallet of the user. We do have an abundance of expectation. We do expect it to work. We do expect it to take off instantly. So we finally reached the end of our 100-year journey and arrived in this future that we call uh, 2016. To me, I'm living a life of science fiction, looking at what's out there compared to what was there 100 years ago. Look at what was launched just this year, or what was made possible in January. A chip that you implant in the bloodstream that picks up an enzyme that alerts you to the fact that you are going to have a heart attack in the next four hours, because the heart emits that enzyme when it's about to go uh, into failure. That chip sends a signal to a receiver on your skin, which in turn transmits a signal to your smartphone. So your blood phones you to tell you that you're going to have a heart attack, and you better get to the hospital. That was February 2016. Mark Zuckerberg walking past his minions, I mean the media, uh, <laughs> while they're all experiencing virtual reality, and he proceeds to tell them that virtual reality will be the next platform for social media. VR goes mainstream. Pepper, the restaurant robot, which is in use in 14,000 locations in Japan, and they're producing another 1,000 every single month, takes your order and brings your food. But in May this year, also could take a payment from you. Now, to me, Pepper is the new celebrity of our time, and we all want a photo with a, a celebrity. So one of the great moments of my life was uh, not meeting Luther Van Dross, but uh, meeting Pepper, <laughs> uh, the robot. And people say, but I want to be served by a human being. But when I said, hello, Pepper, and he said to me, hello, human, I was captivated. I only want to be served by robots from now on because it is such an engaging experience. And the novelty is going to wear off only probably after another 10 to 100 years uh, from now. June this year, Lenovo launches the Moto Z smartphone, which is the sliver, the sliver on top of that uh, device. The piece at the bottom is called the InstaShare. It's a projector and a mod, a, a mod, they call it, that displays whatever is on your screen onto a wall or any other surface. And it can do a 70-inch high-definition display of your Netflix app on your phone. You suddenly don't need a large-screen TV. But it's not yet interactive. In future, that's going to be an interactive display, and you won't need the device or the, the screen on which to, uh, to type. You will have to type on any surface. You can uh, project your keyboard onto a serviette. So in future, we'll be, we'll be buying serviettes instead of smartphones. And then, probably as important as the first hamburger bun, the first self-driven beer delivery uh, in the world. The future is arriving. And then, finally, this month, Huawei, of all people, launched a phone that's got machine learning built into it. This phone will learn your habits and optimize the phone as you go along. So the promise is that 18 months after you've started using the phone, it'll be a better phone than when you started using it. If that works, it will transform the way phones are built. Every single day this year, there's been another innovation. Every day, there's been another way to change the world. You can resist this change, or you can embrace this abundance of innovation. You can choose the future which you want to live. Thank you very much.